Can you guys see my screen? Is this working? And um, you can see the presentation, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'm using multiple screens and I, I'm still getting the hang of it. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for the kind introduction and um, thanks everyone who um, came to this. I'm really excited um, to talk about art and ggplot, um, exploring radial visualizations. And like she said, I'm each Maka. I also go by each. Um, I accept both. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here and talk about art. Um, and so specifically, I'm going to be talking about computational art. And computational art, you may have also heard it referred to as creative coding. And according to Wikipedia, it's when you model, simulate, or replicate creativity using a computer. And, but I think the cool kids do it in R. And my introduction to computational art, um, and I think a lot of people's introduction to computational art is via generative art. And generative art, um, the way it's defined is that you, use an, you have an algorithm or you have a rule set and you enter it into an autonomous system, so like your computer, your program, something, um, and it defines the design of the art. And here's an example of a generative art piece made by, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce his name, but Giorgio Caramanis. I really recommend you follow him on Twitter. He makes really great generative art, and he made this for January, which is a generative art challenge in January. But essentially, like the idea behind this is that there's this thing called flow fields and you can like insert values into the flow fields and it like creates these like curves. And you can see me talking very hand wavy around this because a lot of generative art is like way above my head. I am not a math person. I've never been a math person. I can tell you funny stories of not doing well in math ever in any of my classes. And I think because we think generative art, we think math, we think algorithms. And I think it makes it seem very, it could make it seem very intimidating to make things that like seem beautiful. And this is a very beautiful piece. Um, and, but when you think about it, an algorithm, it's just a well-defined set of instructions. And a lot of people like disagree with this definition, but it is the most like simple definition of an algorithm. And so when, if you think of an algorithm as just a well-defined set of instructions, then this can be an algorithm. And so this is a computational art piece I created. Um, and my algorithm, my rule set, is just these two data frames where I wanted my x to be of a certain length, I wanted my y's to be of a certain length, I wanted another data frame, and then I plotted it and it made the visualization you see on the right. And realizing that computational art can be simple um, and it can be like almost anything you want. And it made me realize that like computational art is like really fun. Um, I started to get really into it late 2020 and it led me to create oops, this zine. So weird to plug myself, but, <laughs> but um, I made a zine and it's called Radial Patterns in ggplot, um, and it can be found on my blog. And the idea is I wanted to explore 30 different circular type visualizations. Um, um, and the really important to me was like, they couldn't use a lot of code. Like it really needed to be like this. And this is an ex another excerpt from my zine where all the code that went into the visualization should be able to be fit on like the same slide. And so you can see all the code here and it's like not that much. And it like created this visualization. Um, and so after creating the zine, um, I got, I think I went from being like really into computational art to being really into the idea that everyone should do computational art. And why I got really into this idea and why I believe you should do computational art is one, it's fun. I find it 
personally to be a lot more fun than doing data visualizations because with data visualizations they give you the data and you have to think what is the best way to visualize the relationships in the data for computational art i make my own data to visualize what i want and so i don't have to worry about missing data i'm making my own data <laughs> or or not enough variables i'm making my own variables and stuff like that so i find it I think it just flexes a different part of my brain and I find that really exciting. Um, and then the other reason is that it can be as simple or as complicated as you like. So I have delved more into like generative art with like algorithms and those, I do that when I'm in the mood and then when I'm willing to like put a lot of time to figure out the math behind the thing, or I can do something that's a lot more simple depending on my mood. But the kind of like the thesis and the overarching theme of this presentation and why I, um, yeah, the thesis overarching theme is that, sorry, um, is that I believe that exploring computational art can lead to inspiration for your data visualizations by learning how to do computational art. I think it like really forces you to become a lot more comfortable with certain geoms because you have to manipulate them to make the art piece that you want. And by manipulating them to make the art piece that you want, you become a lot more knowledgeable and have a better like understanding of the geom. And thus you're then able to take those techniques and apply it to your data, data visualization pieces. All right, so here are two things I created. On the left is a computational art piece. And on the right is a Tidy Tuesday data visualization. And they're kind of different, but they both use the same visualization techniques. And what we're going to do in this presentation, or what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, is that is we're going to create um, two computational art pieces, these two, in order to make the data visualization you saw on the previous slide. And to do that, we're going to talk a lot about segments. And before we talk about segments, there's two important concepts to understand. And so the first concept is that a horizontal versus a vertical segment have different appearances in the polar coordinate system. Um, and the second concept is using a polar coordinate system is one of the easiest ways to make a radial based visualization. All right, so my ride or die geom, the geom that always holds me down, used in almost all of my visualizations is geom segment. And geom segment creates a straight line between points x, y, and x end and y end. So x, y are controlling one end of the segment, and x end and y end are controlling the other end of the segment. All right, and here's an example of that. So I have my ggplot, I added the layer of geom segment, and then in the aesthetics, I said x equals zero, y equals one, x, e x end equals 10, y end equals one. And so you can see here, X starts at zero, it's consistently the line stays at one, and then X ends at 10. And so if you wanna make a horizontal segment, you keep your Y's the same, so Y end and Y should be equal to each other, but then you change your X's. So X and X end should not be equal to each other. And then when you plot it, so this is the same segment from the previous slide, but then when you add a layer, so you change it to be in the polar coordinate system, it makes what I call, and there's definitely probably a technical term for this, like a path. And I like to think of it as a path because when you have a horizontal segment in the polar coordinate system, it makes a path around the center of the circle, as long as you don't have the path at the bottom of the y-axis. And then if you want to make a vertical segment, you make the x's equal to each other because you want the x to be five and the xn to be five. Um, so it makes a vertical segment, but then you change the y's. So the y starts at one and the y end is at 10. And then when you have that in the polar coordinate system, it makes what I like to call a spoke, where it, the vertical segment starts from the center of the circle and it goes to the perimeter of the circle. All right, so now that we are geom segment gurus and we, kind of know the required information to use it, we're going to create this first pattern or this first art piece. 
But before we create it, let's talk about it a little bit. And so what we see here is a, what I like to call a spokes type visualization, which means it was made out of vertical segments. Um, it's rotating, all the lines are like coming out of the center, but are not coming out of dead center, which would be around here, but instead like kind of like a perimeter around the center. And then they are also alternating in heights and all the segments end in like a point. All right, so how do we build it? So first we start with our algorithm or we start with like our rule set. And our rule set is that we want our X to be a sequence from zero to 19 and we want to increment it by 0.5. And I always like for my incrementations to be kind of close to each other because I think it looks better. So I tend to always do like 0.5 or around there. Then because we want vertical lines, the X is equal to the X end. Um, the Y's all start at zero, which is repping it, repeating zero 39 times. And then the Y end is a sequence between five and 10 repeating. And so I take this um, data frame that I called lines and I add it and I plot it using geon segment and it created this visualization. All right, so then to get the dots at the end of the lines, I create a new data frame called dots. And how I always kind of like build my like radial visualizations that where things are like kind of touching each other is I always start with one data frame and then I pull the information from that data frame into the next one. So like using tidyverse, like our dplyr, um, so the pipe, I take lines and then I select from lines x and y end because I want the points to all be at the same spot as the lines, but I want them to start where the line ends. So my geom point is using x and the y end. Yeah, and it made this. And then if you switch it to the polar coordinate system, you get this visualization. And I think this visualization is pretty cool. It's not my cup of tea. When I made it initially, the first thing I thought was, this looks a lot like a spider web. And I, that's not my vibe. That's not my, not my aesthetic. So I wanted to kind of like, if you remember, not have all of it dead center. And so the way to do that is so we're going out of the polar coordinate system for a little bit. And the way that you get the inner circle is you mess with the y-axis. And specifically, you mess with the lower bounds of the y-axis. So I made the y-axis now start at negative five. And so you can see there's a gap now between where the y-axis starts and where the geom segments actually start. And by doing this gap, when you switch back to the core polar, polar coordinate system, <laughs> Um, there's now a center circle in the middle of the visualization. And so this is like now I feel like a bit more what I like. And this is actually the visualization and everything else is just, I don't remember the idiom, sprinkles on the cake, icing on the cake. <laughs> and so you, uh, I made the segments white, I made the background green, and now we have this visualization done. And it wasn't that hard to build. And so now that we've learned how to make this one, we're going to now make the next one, which is kind of similar in ideas, where there's the center circle, it's um, the spokes type pattern, um, all coming out from the center. But then instead for this one, instead of the, um, well, first all the lines are the same length, but um, instead of ending in points, they're ending in like a thicker line. And how do we do that? So again, we start with our first data frame and relied on my um, nifty sequence of zero to 19, incrementing by 0.5. Um, and all the Y's are starting at zero and the Y ends are at three for the vertical line. And then I add a layer, sorry, that's my partner. Um, and then I add a layer where, um, of geom segment and it plotted these lines. Um, and so in order to make the like stacked look of lines, what you do is you literally stack lines. And so I created another data set called outer circle where the Y is now the Y end of the previous one. So the Y end of the previous one was three. So the new segment actually starts somewhere around here. 
And the YN was the previous YN plus six. So now it's going from three to like nine. And I added the geom, but they still look exactly the same. Like it looks like nothing changed. If I didn't point out the Y axis becoming bigger too, you wouldn't have seen anything. And that's because in order to get the difference, you have to mess with the aesthetics of the geom segment. And so I made the lower one 0.5 and I made the top one too. And now we have this effect of the line becoming thicker. And, and then by adding it, switching it to the polar coordinate system, we get closer again to the visualization. So we can see how it looks. But again, I never really like when all the points, uh, all the lines meet in the middle. I don't know why it's a personal thing, I think. Um, and so again, we're going out of the cord polar coordinate system and I'm making the Y axis now start at negative like two-ish. And by doing so, it's going to have a smaller inner circle, which we can see here. It's not as large as the other one. And that's how you kind of like mess with the inner circle radius is that you change where you change, you make the Y axis lower limits more negative if you want the inner circle radius to be larger. And then again, just we then pretty it up because we have the foundation of it. So we make the segments white and then I made the background this like reddish pink brown color. And so cool. What have we learned? We like flew through two visualizations, but the two most important things or the three most important things that we learned is that how to have the line segment seem to end in another geom. So we went from the vertical line ending in a point and then also how to have the line segment change appearance. We stacked two lines on top of each other and then we just changed the aesthetics of them. So they looked like the line changed appearance as it like got further from the center and closer to the perimeter. And also we learned that cord polar is a magical coordinate system because we were able to create radial visualizations and not at all talk about radians or angles or trigonometry, which is the other way you would have to create circles without using that layer. All right, so now that we've talked about all these tricks, and I think we're like, we are true computational artists now, we know what we're doing. Uh, we're going to use what we learned from those techniques and create this Tidy Tuesday data visualization. And yeah, let's talk about it a bit more. And so this is from, I put week three here and I now start to feel like it's not week three, but this is from 2020 in Tidy Tuesday. And it was about Avatar, which is, a, if you don't know, a TV show that aired on Nickelodeon in like 2010, maybe, I don't know. And so in the data set, there's the book, the book number, the chapter, the chapter number, and the character. And the thing to know is each book is a season. So there's like water, fire, earth. And so all of those are seasons in Avatar. And then each chapter is an episode. Um, and so this is referring to the episode number and this is the name of the episode. And then they have the character here because also in the data frame or in the data set is the lines of the character per episode. So this is like the first two lines in the data frame. And you can see that um, they have the character of Katara and they have what she spoke in book one, episode one or book one, chapter one. And so using this information, I decided to ask a question, who mentioned Appa and how many times per episode? because Appa was my favorite character or is my favorite character when I used to watch um, Avatar. And so the aims of the visualization is we want a spoke type radial visualization. So it's the vertical lines thing again, where each episode or chapter is a line segment and the length of the line segment is the number of mentions of Appa per chapter. And then we also want the line segments to have two different appearances. So this is like um, what the data set ends up looking like after I do a lot of data cleaning, which um, if you want to see the data cleaning that I did, it will be available in the slides. And so we have the book number, so the season number, the chapter number, so the episode number. I'm going to skip this column for now. Then we have the character. And this is the character who mentioned Oppa most 
in that episode. And this is the amount of times Abba mentioned some is the amount of times they mentioned Appa in the episode. So we can see in book one, chapter one, Aang mentioned Appa 10 times. And um, that was the most mentions of Appa in that episode. And there's this extra column called mentions max. And that is the maximum amount of times, um, no, for the character who mentioned Appa most, the maximum amount of times Abba was mentioned. So it was like 15. And this is going to like help us in the visualization um, later down the line. All right, so we're starting the visualization and we're starting again, geom segment, where we want vertical lines. So X and XN are chapter sequence because we want each line to represent a chapter or an episode of the show. And then I wanted all of the lines to start out zero and the ends to represent how many times Oppa was mentioned. Um, but you can see like Oppa wasn't mentioned a consistent amount of times each episode. Uh, so it's causing like this kind of like jaggedy effect. And if we put that in polar quarter, I always switch this up. If we put this in the polar coordinate system, <laughs> it would look very, not as pretty as what I would want, I guess is the best way to say it. And so the way that I got around that is I added another layer and I added another geom segment layer. And so you can see here that the X's are remaining the same, but the Y is now starting where the previous segment ended and the Y end is the mentions max that I talked about before. And that allowed all these lines to end at 15. So all the lines are having like a consistent end and then I changed the aesthetics again so we can have the appearance of two different lines or the line changing part of the way through. So the first one is like a solid line and then the second layer is now line type dotted and it adds like kind of like a dotted dash line effect. And then I didn't really talk about um, pulling this data but I wanted to indicate for each chapter um, what season it was in, so what book it was in. So I pulled the images um, that represent, represent each season from the internet, and I used Geom image, which is part of the GG image package, I believe it is. And so each X is a chapter, and each Y ends, kind, could have ended that mentioned max, but I did plus two, because I wanted, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, I wanted it to be offset it a little bit and a pro tip well not a pro tip i learned this the hard way about geom image is you always want the size to be quite small if you make the size one it will just make the image cover your whole plot so you tend to actually be working with things less than like 0.5 most of the time and so now we have for each chapter an image that indicates um what book it's in all right, and then we switch it to the polar coordinate system. And so we now have our like radial visualization, but there's something a little off about it. And if you look at the top right here, um, the icons are overlapping. So the water and the, the water and the fire, yes, are overlapping here. And this actually happens pretty often in the polar coordinate system where like your ends overlap. And it happened with the other visualizations, but I didn't point it out because it didn't impact it at all because all the lines were like the same length, so you couldn't see it at all. Um, but it's happening here and we wanna fix it. And the way we fix it is we mess, I keep saying mess, we change the, the X axis. And so we're now having the X axis start at zero and end where it ended before at 61. And now these two no longer overlap. All right. So we fixed that issue, but we now have the issue of, I hate when lines meet in the middle. And so we want to have a distinct inner circle similar to all the computational art pieces. And so we do what I talked about where we change the y-axis. And so I made the y-axis the most negative that we've seen so far, where it's now going to negative 15 in order to have a pretty big circle here because I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff in there. Well, not throw a lot of stuff, but throw something in there. 
Um, but before we do that, I want to create an outline. Um, and the way we create an outline, because it's not going to be going this way, like all the chapter segments are, and it's going to be going around, it's going to be a horizontal segment. And so let's briefly flip out of the polar coordinate system and look at this. So this is, I added a layer for geom segment. I want a horizontal segment. So the y's are equal to each other, but the x's are not. So, and how I tend to do it is I get them to align with like the width of the image. So because our x goes from zero to 61, our x is at zero and our xn is at 61 to span the whole image. And then we go back to the polar coordinate system and we have the path type circle. And the next thing we're going, going to do is we are going to throw an image <laughs> in the center of the circle. We're going to add the picture of Appa that you saw earlier. And the way to do that, and sorry, again, we're going to flip out of the polar coordinate system. And I keep flipping in and out because this is actually how I build data visualizations in the polar coordinate system. I think as you're like getting more used to it, you kind of want to like take it out of it so you can actually see the axes. So you see like, okay, X is this and Y is this. And then you flip it back into the polar coordinate system to be like, okay, and how does it look? So we're going out and I want to add Oppa to the center of the circle. So if I want to add Oppa to the center of the circle, that actually means in the like Cartesian coordinate system, which is what it's in right now, you put Oppa near the bottom and you also put Oppa like dead center. And so by putting Oppa like here near the bottom, dead center of the visualization, when we go back to the polar coordinate system, he's now dead center of our circle. Um, and that's like a good trick for that. And then I think everything else is like, again, just some pizzazz. <laughs> and so to not go too deep into it, for each chapter segment, I, um, I added a label using geom text, which indicates who spoke up of the most that episode or that book and episode. So for example, here, because I was hovering over it, Sokka in book three, episode seven mentioned off of the most. And then I changed the background, um, got rid of all the grid lines, made a dark black outline because I was kind of going for kind of like a, um, a poster, like an old tiny poster type of effect. And that's um, this visualization, that's how we created it. So I feel like after we created the visualization, it could almost feel like um, did we really use the techniques that I talked about earlier? And I kind of kind of want to highlight that we did. And I think the best way to highlight that we did is to revisit them, but revisit them outside of the polar coordinate system and just like how they would look before in the Cartesian plane, um, before you add the cord polar layer. And so this is on the left is the first computational art piece that we created. And on the right is a Tidy Tuesday data visualization. And you can see we did use similar technique ideas where for in order to have the inner circle, we didn't have, um, we don't have the Y segment starting at the bottom. We like expanded it past the beginning of the segments. And then we also like the same idea of like, okay, how do you have your segment and in a different image type thing, where it was a point here and geom image where I kind of think about it as like geom point often just because it uses like the same arguments, um, we use that here. So that technique um, informed this part of the technique. And then for the second computational art piece, we talked about how do you have the line change appearance and so for here, we stacked two geon segments, and we also stacked two geon segments here. But for here, we changed the size between the two, so it looked like that. And for here, we changed the appearance, I would say. So um, this went from a solid line to dotted lines. All right, and so um, I hope that with this presentation, which I may have talked very quickly through, <laughs> 
Um, I hope that you feel like you can do computational art now. I hope that it feels a bit more accessible for you. I hope that it feels fun. I had a lot of fun creating those pieces. And if not for fun, if you're someone where it's like, how is this going to better me? I really do think it helps improve your data visualization skills um, and like helps teach you techniques. Um, and I have a personal um, thing that I started doing where I include a picture of my dog in every presentation. So this is my dog Waffles. Um, here she is cuddled in some blankets and she says, thank you so much for attending. Um, this is my Twitter handle and also this is the GitHub um, repo where my slides are already posted. And I will also be posting right after this um on my twitter account a link to these slides i'll get it on my blog eventually um hopefully <laughs> um but thank you so much and i can also stop should i stop sharing How? maybe leave it if someone wants to ask a question okay does anyone have any questions Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Yes, I really like your work. Thank you for this uh, presentation. It's really motivating. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I think uh, everyone who assists uh, in this meetup uh, will start doing art with R. So thanks very much for, for this. Thank you so much for um, having me. I'm excited. This was brilliant. I, I especially loved the trick of the, the dots from the end to the max. That was very clever. Was Thank you. <laughs> super clever. So I don't know. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to yeah. uh, unmute or tap them in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. I think that this is a, a really nice way to teach, like if you wanted to teach ggplot. You know, it's a fun, <laughs> yeah, not just plotting some histograms or something, yeah. you know, like if you're yeah. plotting art, you might get your students more engaged. <laughs> the <material>. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we, when uh, you try to, um, for students, like, uh, I mean, children, it's a very interesting <laughs> way to make them doing uh, uh, R and uh, some graphs with uh, maybe some characters. Hmm. Oh, there's a question for you. Um, let me see. How do I access? Oh, it says I'll read it for you. It says for the for the geom image. How mm -hmm. do you organize your images in the file? Ah, okay. So um, without showing my very messy <laughs> folder structure, how I like to do it is I actually have like a tidy Tuesday folder. Um, and in the tidy Tuesday folder, I have the scripts, I have my outputs, and then I have my like additional information. And so my like additional, all the pictures I always download, I put in there and I like title it based off the like, um, project so the like images i used it was like avatar book fire avatar this and they're all in the folder so i was able to just connect to them and pull them in pretty easily mm -hmm. um and so that's how i organize it i like to um for tidy tuesday just because it like tends i tend to not actually actually that's not true i've been using a lot of additional images recently um but like um, I used to not do it a lot, so it tends, it, for me, the easiest file organization strategy is just naming it well. And so by always having a consistent naming strategy of like, what is the like visualization? So for example, this week is like about the Tate Art Gallery. And so if I was doing that one, which I'm trying, but I'm struggling a little bit, um, it would be like Tate underscore and then like the name of the like image.
I, I hope that answers the, the question. If not, Bia, yeah, you're well, well, welcome to. There she <laughs> says, she says, that he or she says, thank you. Um, Ozzy then asks, how do you go about interpreting such plots if you come across one that wasn't plotted by you? It's quite a nice question. I suppose, I suppose the, what he's trying to say is how would you, if you saw one, how would you go plot it yourself? How would you figure out how to ah, plot it yourself? Okay. That's actually a really great question <laughs> because that yeah. is something I try to do with various levels of success. So especially with computational art pieces, um, I tend to, in order to make sure I'm not like copying someone's work explicitly, I try to like be inspired by other things. So right now I'm exploring rugs. <laughs> like there's a whole idea of, I feel like I'm exposing myself and now I have to like really <laughs> produce something from it. I hope I'm able to figure it out, but I'm really into um, like Midwestern, like Arizona type like um, rug patterns because they use very like earthy palettes and it tends to be like these nice lines but then they like become thicker in random places and so the first thing I do is I kind of like look at it and I go like all right what do I think would help me create that and sometimes I sketch it out where I was like okay if I was building this how would I like how would it look literally in like an x y coordinate system if i was doing six segments or lines and then i start with a really for very complicated pieces i start with like a really small section to just kind of like ideate and be like okay how do i make this simply and then once i understand the like pattern to make things simply then i start doing things complicated because something i realized with computational art is like some of the stuff could be easier if I was better at math, but I'm not great at math, but I'm very good at pattern recognition. And I'm very good at being like, okay, this is how the pattern's repeating. And this is how I can take information from this one place to then build onto the next spot. And so that's kind of how I approach it, where um, start small, go big and get really creative. Um, there's been times where I was like, uh, I like really don't want to figure out the math for this. Um, and I really wanted to like have a circle of a certain size and instead of like doing the whole like sequence from zero to two pi sign of this cos of this um i use g on point and i mess with the size until it was the size i wanted <laughs> so you can like get really creative in ways um i would also recommend if you're like if you want to explore alternative shapes or like um line segment types with like curves you should really check out the gg force package um, I find, I find the package kind of intimidating sometimes because it has a lot of required arguments and doesn't really always explain what that required argument is. Like, it'll be like the radius and I'm like, triangles have radiuses? I'm very confused by this, <laughs> but um, play around with it and then you'll start to understand what it's doing. It's very, very cool. Yeah, it's a great package. Hmm. I feel like if, if, if you've got some creativity, this is, this is fun. Maybe I should try and dig deep for my creativity. <laughs> oh, Vabash, yeah. maybe we can make a, a, a logo of this. You could. That could be cool. There we go. Like, <laughs> uh, idea. like this, uh, ooh, flying through the presentation. This, the, a funny story about this cover sheet was I was looking through Creative Commons images and I was talking to my partner and I was like, uh, none of these are exactly what I want. And he's like, aren't you an artist? Can't you just make exactly what you want? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> and so I created this because I really wanted like kind of something that was giving like a flower fireworks type thing yeah. without mm. being literal. And every time I looked up flower or firework, all the pictures were super literal. And he was like, just create it can't you create stuff? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. I can figure it out. <laughs> okay, Babash, we'll do it. Yes, I, I like this idea. Maybe we can make yeah. a tortilla. Um, yes, beautiful idea. Yeah. Okay, we, we might need some additional assistance. This is going out <laughs> to all the participants. <laughs> yeah, yes. You're all welcome. <laughs> our, our community. 
come help us <laughs> create a logo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Renata says. <laughs> Okay, well, I know, you know, Renata's very good. We can just ask Renata to do it for us. I'm joking, Renata. <laughs> <laughs> you can be part of the team. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask any questions? I think those questions were really excellent. Ozzy, and just Ozzy, if, if that does in fact answer your question. It's Ozzy still, yes, Ozzy still here. Oh uh, yeah, it, it does. So in terms of explanatory data analysis, so um, if you get some plots like this, you would want to explain it to people. You want to convey a message to them saying that this is what I was trying to do and this is what I want you to see. This is the message I want you to get. So uh, I'm wondering how I was going to uh, get that message across to them so that they see it from the perspective that I was looking at it as well. Mm -hmm. so, but thank you very much, Aja. I think I really, I really get it. Yeah. Um, and for, and realizing I didn't completely answer your question, I also think like when you're creating data visualizations, don't shy away from overly labeling and adding text to your visualizations. So like, um, ah, did I go to, oh my gosh, I think I was pressing down when I meant to press left. <laughs> so for example, in this data visualization, like we don't see it we didn't see it in the creation of it because I didn't want to like talk about like text and stuff like that too much. But in here, it says the character who most discusses Appa each episode is displayed with the book and chapter noted. And so you're able, I, you have the data visualization and then you, I also very plainly said, what is the data visualization showing? So I, don't, I think don't shy away from that. Um, another really cool thing to do is I could have added a legend at the bottom where I could have had the legend be a line and then with the dots and the book and I could have labeled it where it's like the solid line is the number of mentions. The dots are nothing. The, <laughs> and then the, the image is um, what book or what season the segment is associated with. So I think um, sometimes, and I also kind of do this, especially with Tidy Tuesdays because I'm like, I like, put a lot of effort into making it pretty and then I'm like I give up I'm tired um, but like uh, labeling drawing arrows to things have an explanatory text at the top is a really great way to like um, essentially have a visualization that explains itself and make sure it's conveying the message that you want people to have um, in like scientific research they always say that like your figure should be a standalone figure. So someone should be able to pick up your figure off the street and understand everything about it without reading your paper. So your title should be um, explain what's going on. You should have footnotes and stuff like that. And I think the same thing with data visualizations, but instead of like having like a paragraph long of footnotes or like an over explanatory title, you can have like a good title you can have a subtitle, you can use legends, you can use labeling, and all of that can help make sure that when people see your visualization, they understand what you're trying to communicate through the visualization. So I hope that helps. Anybody else? Well, you have her in person, well, virtual person. <laughs> and I finally was able to um, open the chat. I don't know why it wasn't working. <laughs> it's quite difficult. When you present, it's really difficult to find yeah. everything. It like changes it. And then, and then you can't see half the, I don't know, Zoom yeah. needs to fix that. <laughs> Spicy like all comments. Like Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, um, Renat, it's exactly like the posters they made of Opla. That is exactly what I was inspired by. <laughs> Thank you for knowing. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show. I really do. <laughs> it's great. I actually, um, I rewatched it in November, beginning December and November. Mm -hmm. So I it's like fresh it in my mind. <laughs> what did you? Yeah, when it once it came on Netflix, I was like immediately like, yes, I have to rewatch this. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on Netflix, yeah, Renata? 
Um, I no. kind of stole it. So I don't know. I don't have Netflix though. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be there. <laughs> it's kind of like it's people would call it a kids show, but like the themes are really deep and it's mm. just generally amazing. It's really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. Cool. I, I think if no one else has any questions, uh, we can close the meetup. Um, I just want to say thanks to everyone for uh, attending. Um, uh, both uh, our ladies wouldn't be a community if it wasn't for our participants. Um, so thanks for joining us. And it was really nice to uh, learn about computational art. That was very fun. I think that was a splendid way to start off the year. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to have to, you're going to have to meet this expectation year <laughs> on year, Inga. I, I don't oh. know. <laughs> Should have started lower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we set the bar too high. <laughs> oh, well, thanks again.